Whenever you have occasion to send a card, remember a Hallmark card will best express your perfect taste, your thoughtfulness. The Hallmark Charlotte Greenwood Show. And here she is, that lovable lady of stage, screen, and radio, Charlotte Greenwood. Today we tell a story about a young girl who fails to realize in time the consequences of a careless word. And then... But that's her responsibility. There's no reason why you should get mixed up in it. But, Mr. Drake, I wouldn't be true to myself if I didn't do what I could to help a friend. You know, it seems to me people always dump their problems in your lap, cast their burdens on you, unload their responsibilities on you. Haven't you just about had everything thrown at you, Mrs. Greenwood? <laughs> everything except rice and old shoes. <laughs> <laughs> And it isn't Mrs. Greenwood, it's Miss Greenwood. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, you're sorry. <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, Charlotte Greenwood is brought to you this Sunday and every Sunday at this time by the makers of Hallmark greeting cards to remind you that whenever you want to remember someone, you'll find a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say the way you want to say it. So when you choose a card, look on the back for the three identifying words, a Hallmark card. Yes, don't forget, a Hallmark card will best express your perfect taste, your thoughtfulness. Barton home in the little town of Lakeview, where Aunt Charlotte is raising the three Barton youngsters, little Robert, teenage Jack, and Barbara. It's early Sunday afternoon. The whole family is in the living room with a whole Sunday newspaper, but nobody has two consecutive pages. Aunt Charlotte is saying, Children, if you come across page six of the homemaking section, tell me how many eggs this angel food cake recipe calls for. All right. Oh, Barbara, here's that uh, write-up about the Country Club Bazaar last night. Oh, that's what I've been looking for, Jack. What does it say? Uh, let's see. Country Club holds gala affair, as reported by Jimmy Ellis. I know Jimmy Ellis. Yes, I did. know him too, Robert. But right now, I'm more interested in hearing about the bazaar. Go on, Jack. Uh, well, it says, um... The annual bazaar of the Lakeview Country Club, uh, held last night, was acclaimed by all as the most successful of the series. <laughs> Due to Mrs. Gregory Vanderhoff Delmar's tireless efforts, the entire evening went off without a hit. <laughs> Pretty good, eh, Aunt Charlotte? Oh, I don't know. Despite my tireless efforts, I've gone on an entire lifetime without a hit. <laughs> Car. Robert, please. We're not interested in Jimmy Ellis or his car. Go on, Jack. What are some of the details? Uh, let's see. Uh, there's here, um... Uh, oh, uh, Harry Potter thrilled the guests with a fancy driving exhibition. Johnny Lawton won the golf tournament. Oh, and here's a picture of Mary Graham who won the obstacle race. Oh, boy, I love those races. Yeah, me too. Hey, Aunt Charlotte, were you ever in an obstacle race? <laughs> I'm still in it. <laughs> No, no, I mean a real obstacle race. Yes, and before the race started, the judge came right over to me and said, Young lady, <clears throat> young lady, mind you, mm -hmm. you are the first obstacle. <laughs> I got a dollar for it, too, but that was only the beginning. What do you mean, Aunt Charlotte? Well, there I was, standing with the money in my hand, and the next thing I knew, they gave me first prize in the charade contest for best representing a book. Well, what book did they think was represented by money in you? Jack and the Beanstalk. <laughs> Please give me that paper. Gertrude Grayson will be here in a few minutes, and I've got to have something to tell her about the bazaar. Oh, sorry, can't she read? Barbara, if you're trying to make Gertrude believe that you were at that bazaar last night when you weren't, you know, that's a great mistake. That's not right. But Aunt Charlotte, when she gave me her ticket, I promised I'd go. I can't tell her I forgot it was the night of Robert's music class recital. Why not? Oh, because I don't want to hurt her feelings. It was a good recital. Indeed it was, darling. You played well. 
Barbara, is it Gertrude's feelings or your own that you're thinking of? Oh, how do you think she'll feel if I tell her I let her ticket go to waste? Well, how do you think you'll feel if you let her believe you used the ticket and then she finds out you didn't? Well, I can't tell it. I've got to tell her something. There are many arguments in favor of telling the truth. For one thing, you don't have to remember what you said. I just wish I was going to that dude ranch right now instead of next weekend. Then I wouldn't have to see Gertrude at all. Until you got back, and then you'd spend the whole weekend fretting over Gertrude. You'd be glad you're not going till next Friday. Mm, I've been so upset, I haven't had time to think about what clothes to take. Well, you've got a whole week to think about what clothes to take, which ought to be enough for any woman. Aunt Charlotte, if you were going to a dude ranch, what would you take besides riding clothes? A pillow. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, is it all right with you if I use your alligator bag? Oh, you're ruined cramming it full of stuff. It can't possibly hold everything you have. Well, it held everything the alligator had. Oh. <laughs> hey, Jack, if we're going to ball game today, shouldn't we sort of get started, kind of? Oh, gosh, yeah, I didn't realize the time. Come on, Brad. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder what the score's going to be. Well, ask me after the game. I can't tell you the score before the game starts. Yes, you can. Nothing to nothing before the game starts. <laughs> What an umpire. <laughs> so long, Aunt Charlotte. And cheer up, Barbara. Yeah, yeah Barbara. Three cheers. Hip, hip, hooray. Hip, hip, hooray. Here, and I'll save those hip, hips for the game. Now, have a good time, boys. Bye. I wish I were going with them instead of having to spend the afternoon with Gertrude. What am I going to tell you? Now, Barbara, now, we're not going all over that again. Oh, well, but that's Gertrude now. Yeah, we'll soon find out. Good afternoon, Miss Greenwood. I'm Walter Drake, the new city editor of the Dispatch. Oh, yes, Mr. Drake. Mr. Anderson told me about you. Please come in. Thank you. And this is my niece, Barbara Barton. Oh, How do you do, Mr. Barton? Drake? Miss Greenwood, while well, Mr. Anderson is away, I'm more or less taking over his work. Oh, you've got quite a job on your hands. <laughs> Mr. Anderson told me that you had oceans of ability. You're a mountain of strength and a rock of stability. <laughs> <laughs> if I had a lake, I'd make a pretty good real estate of that development. <laughs> How can I help you, Mr. Drake? Well, after all, Miss Greenwood, you used to write for the dispatch, so you know all the ins and outs. I know you're in. I'm out. <laughs> oh, and tell the way you talk, people would think you were fired. Well, believe me, Miss Greenwood, you're leading us with our loss. <laughs> Your news articles were always brilliant. Your interviews were perfect. Oh, come, come, Mr. Drake. And certainly no other paper ever had features like yours. No other woman has either. <laughs> <laughs> Thank heaven. Oh, Aunt Charlotte. But, Mr. Drake, does all this mean that you want me to return to the dispatch? Frankly, yes. Well, it's very complimentary, but at the moment it wouldn't be possible. Uh, well, then, Miss Greenwood, uh, could I ask you to help in case of an emergency? Oh, of course. I'd be glad to help. Oh, thanks, Miss Greenwood. Because it's extremely difficult to meet deadlines, even with the adjusted manpower problem. Mm -hmm. But then you, uh, you know what it's like being in a tight squeeze. Only from here, say. <laughs> But you seem to be meeting your deadlines and doing a fine job. Today's paper was excellent. Well, we had a good local story. And uh, Jimmy Ellis did a masterful job covering the bazaar last night. Yes, he did. Uh, did Mr. Ellis have anything special to say about the bazaar, Mr. Drake? Only that he had the best time of his life. I'm sorry I couldn't get there myself, but then I was at the office until 1 o'clock. That's when we go to press, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, didn't Jimmy Ellis have anything else to say about the bazaar? No, no, nothing special. Uh, well, Miss Greenwood, I'd better be on my way. Uh, thank you for calling, Mr. Drake. Goodbye, Miss Greenwood, and thank you. As long as you're standing by, I'm ready for whatever comes along. <laughs> I've been standing by so long, I almost feel the same way. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Oh, here comes Gertrude, Barbara. <laughs> Good afternoon, Gertrude. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Isn't it day, Pinky Winky? I mean, I think it really is. I mean, it is really. Is Myra Kent here? No, what? Well, I told his to meet here. I thought we'd all take a walk in the park. I mean, it's really a uh... grand day for a walk. Yes. <laughs> it's a Pinky Winky day. I mean, I think it really is. I mean, it is really. Yeah, I'm convinced. <laughs> the ball game with Robert. Oh, I just love ball games. I mean, I actually do. I was practically brought up in the Yankee Stadium. Yeah, wasn't it a little drafty? <laughs> oh, no, it was darling. <laughs> when did you meet the two dance, Barbara? Right after work next Friday afternoon. Oh, I think these dances are fascinating. 
Oh, but I do say it's mean the way the cowboys wear those beastly things in the heels of their shoes and stick the horses. Oh, those are spurs. They have to wear them to make the horse start. But why do they have to have one on each shoe? That's what I say. Start one side of the horse and the other side's bound to go. <laughs> I think that would be too sweet. I mean, I think that really would. Yes, you mean it really would. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll make some. Oh, Barbara, I'm so glad I gave you my ticket. Did you have a good time for the guy last night? Oh, yes, I, I had lots of fun. Everybody did. Jimmy Ella said he had the best time of his life. As I was saying to Connie Evans, oh, did you know she quit her job in Mount City and came home because her husband Pam and got the army now? Oh, but then you must have talked to her at the bazaar last night. Well, uh, well, no, there was such a crowd, and well, when I noticed her, she was just leaving with her husband. Her husband? Mm -hmm. Tom? Oh, that's funny. Tom didn't arrive here and left you until 11 o'clock this morning. I mean, he didn't get here until 11. Oh. Well, to tell him, so you say it couldn't have been her husband. No. No, I guess it wasn't. Oh, that must be Myra now. You let her in while I run upstairs and say hello. All right. Oh, Myra, Barbara saw Connie Evans leaving the bazaar last night with a man. Did you see who it was? No, but I suppose it was her husband. But Tom didn't get home until today. You mean she left there with some other man? That's what Barbara said. Hey, wait a minute. Camille has left early, too. That is funny. Mm -hmm. It's very funny. Because Barbara mentioned his name, too. She said he had the time of his life. Mm -hmm. You suppose I should have... Myra, you know... <laughs> you know very well that Connie and Jimmy used to go together when they were in high school. Yes, Can you see the secret? Secret? What? Well, Dick and I left about one o'clock. And when we went out to the parking area, we noticed a couple sitting in a car... And after what you just told me, I'm sure it was Jimmy Ellis's car. Hello, Ethel. Don't breathe this to a soul. Barbara Barton saw Connie Ellis and Jimmy Ellis out in the country club, and they both came out early and sang Jimmy's car for hours. I mean, they actually did. Yes, there's a thing that you can do a thing like that while her husband was fighting over Jimmy. Barbara's out of town for a weekend trip. Oh, very important that I see her. Oh, but she'll be back Sunday evening. I'm her aunt. Won't you come in? Are you a friend of Barbara's? Yes. Until today, I thought she was a friend of mine. Oh. I knew her at high school, but I haven't seen her since I was graduated. I've been working in Mound City while my husband Tom was overseas. Well, I'll be very glad to take the message if you want to leave word for Barbara. I don't want to leave word for her. I only want to see her. I want to have a good look at a person as low as she is. Those are hard words, Mrs. Evans. They don't fit my barber at all. Now, if through some misunderstanding Barbara's hurt you in any way, I'm certain that she'll do everything she can to make things right. What can she do now? What can anybody do? Even if she told the truth now, you know it won't convince Tom. He's heard the same disgusting lie from him too many other people. You can't stop the whole town from talking. You can't do it. It's too late for that, don't you see? Mrs. Evans, whatever is wrong, I want to help you. But first you've got to tell me what it is, and then you've got to tell me what you want of Barbara. Barbara started those lies about me. And I want to know why. Why she said it. Why she lied. And why she did it to me. Well, there are a few whys. I want to know why about two. <laughs> the summer vacations are over and the busy fall season is beginning, perhaps some of you may not find time to keep in touch with your friends as you'd like to. Before you know it, their birthdays, anniversaries have slipped by. 
Yes, so just a few moments at your Hallmark dealers could have saved the day. Spare those few moments tomorrow. It takes a little time to find a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say the way you want to say it. See the many fine Hallmark birthday cards, so distinctive in design and sentiment. See the clever, humorous birthday cards. And remember a bride and groom or your favorite couple on their anniversary? Choose a beautiful Hallmark card that says congratulations with charm, with taste. You'll want to be the first to send best wishes when a certain bundle from heaven arrives. Just as you'd be the last to forget a friend who is ill when your gay Hallmark cheer card can mean so much. So make your selection at your Hallmark dealers tomorrow. Hallmark cards are on display at America's finest stores. Don't forget, a Hallmark card will best express your perfect taste, your thoughtfulness. And now back to the Hallmark Charlotte Greenwood show. It's early the following Saturday morning. Barbara is away spending the weekend at a dude ranch unaware of the havoc she has caused by her seemingly innocent fib about seeing Connie Evans at the Country Club Bazaar. Robert is out on his newspaper route while Aunt Charlotte is serving Jack his breakfast. Robert this morning, he should have been back long ago. Yeah, and with Barbara away, this just doesn't seem like a regular breakfast at all. Hi, Aunt Charlotte. Hi, Jack. Hi. Aren't you a little late this morning, son? Yeah, the papers were late. We had to wait about an hour for them. Oh, what was the trouble? I don't know, but everybody in the office was upset. I'm hungry. Could you eat a bowl of berries and bran? I could eat a house. <laughs> well, bran has fewer splinters. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down. Okay. Was Mr. Drake upset at the office? I don't know. I never see him. See, delivering papers every morning should give you an appetite. I bet I walk ten miles. No, I bet you don't. Well, it seems like it. Well, it seems you should swallow your food before you speak, it seems. <laughs> I'll go. You boys finish your breakfast. Fine, Mr. Drake. Mr. Greenwood, this is Aunt Charlotte. When I spoke to you the other day, I hardly expected I'd have to call upon you for help quite so soon, but oh, we're really in a jam. My nephew tells me the dispatch was late this morning. Yeah, it's almost 40 minutes. We had to revise our whole first page. Our lead stories, which Jimmy Ellis normally covered, had to be reassigned at the last minute. What happened? Well, I hated to do it, but I had to let Jimmy Ellis go. Oh, you discharged him? Yes. Yes, I phoned Mr. Anderson long distance, and as soon as I told him the facts, he insisted I get rid of Ellis immediately. What facts, Mr. Drake? Well, they, they aren't very pleasant, Miss Greenwood. Well, we were told that Ellis has been running around with the wife of some serviceman who just came back from overseas. Really? Well, of course. Of course, that... uh, Ellis's private life is his own affair, but with the dispatch running editorials on questions facing returning servicemen, we couldn't very well have our own man doing one of the very things we've, we've been condemning. Well, oh, Mr. Drake, are you sure that what you heard about Jimmy Ellis is really a fact? Well, it comes from a pretty reliable source. What did Ellis himself say? Oh, I, I didn't discuss it with him. I, I just didn't have the heart. But to discharge a man without getting at the facts? Mr. But... Anderson said let him go, and that's all I could do. But how could you without hearing his side? The whole thing sounds reasonable enough. Men overseas, wives left alone. Well, it's, it's human nature. No, it isn't, Mr. Drake. I can't agree with you. That kind of thinking that breeds mistrust would try and make a man and a woman lose the beauty of their love when they're apart. It's that kind of thinking that makes people put two and two together and get five. The only facts you have about Jimmy Ellis are what people are saying. Well, well, would you, Mr. Drake, consider that authentic enough for a story in your paper? Would you risk your reputation on a decision that gossip is true? No, no, of course not. Well, then why risk somebody else's reputation? Just the same when the whole town starts talking. Well, when the whole town starts talking, the voice of truth is usually drowned out. Hmm. Well... Anyhow, it'll all blow over. And in the meantime, I've got a newspaper to get out. Now, I need a capable person to take over Jimmy Ellis's assignment. Will you help me out? Yes, I will. Good, good. As soon as... Uh, how soon can you report at the office? I'm not reporting at the office, Mr. Day. But you said... I said I'd help, and I will. I'm going to help you find and get Jimmy Ellis back. But I can't take him back under the circumstances. Well, we're going to see about those circumstances, too, Mr. Day. I want you to find the Ellis boy and bring him out here tomorrow evening. Will you make it about nine o'clock? The address is 403 Spring Street. You will come. 
That's nice of you. Then will you make it about 8.30 tomorrow night? Good evening. Greenwood. That's right. I'm the fellow you talked to on the phone. Tom Epps, Connie Cousins. Oh, yes. You asked me to be here at 8.30. Well, here I am. Thank you. Please come in. Okay, now, if you've got something to tell me about Connie, let's have it. Well, I think you're making a mistake about Connie, Mr. Evans. Now, wait a minute. You said over the phone you had something to tell me. I didn't come here for advice. This is my business and nobody else's. I'll handle it my own way. I can't agree with you, Mr. Evans. It isn't your business and nobody else's. It happens to be my business, too. What do you mean? My niece, Barbara Barton, is accused of starting this story. Is your niece in the habit of making up deliberate lies? No. Of course she isn't. All right, Maybe it wasn't deliberately made up. Maybe it was only careless talk. Careless talk is like a ball that rolls downhill. The faster it rolls, the faster the dirt flies. But you don't know Connie the way I do. What she's like. Anything about her. I know she's been hurt. Dreadfully hurt. Oh, she's been hurt. It doesn't matter what happens to me. I didn't say that. Connie's been hurt because she's been found out. <laughs> so now she turns on the tears, and pretty soon she has everybody believing that she's the injured party and that I'm the heel. I don't think she's trying to make anyone believe anything except that the story isn't true. Sure, so she comes over here and gives you a yarn about how your niece made up the whole thing. What did your niece say about it? I haven't talked to her. She's out of town. She would be. You can bet Connie knew she was out of town. Well, I'll take the story as is. Get back. Only the story isn't true. I can prove it isn't. How? Say Connie's word for it? Or maybe you'd rather take Jimmy Ellis. If I ever get my hands on him. Well, I might have expected to find something like this long before I let the other side. It's a curious thing how often you do find exactly what you expect to find, even though it really isn't there. I don't get you. When you were away from Connie, you thought about her a lot. You had time to think and to wonder and to commence imagining things. I'm not imagining anything. I know all about Connie and Jimmy Ellis, but... Ah, never mind. Let's just skip it. Only, only when you're over there, and what you dream about most is coming home. It's the most wonderful thing in the world. And then you do get back and find... Goodbye. Wait. Wait just a moment. Oh, I'm so glad you got here, Mr. Drake. Greenwood, against my better judgment, but at your insistence, I brought Jimmy Ellis. Ellis? Hello, Tom. I've been wanting to see you. All right, here I am. But you're wrong about Connie. I've seen her just once since you went away. A week ago, last Saturday night at the country club. Yeah, and you sat in your car with her till one o'clock in the morning. Please, please, gentlemen, don't start anything. No, not until you've looked at a certain article in last Sunday's dispatch. Here it is. It's the story about the country club bazaar by Jimmy Ellis. What's this got to do with it? Oh, a great deal. Mr. Drake, what time would Jimmy Ellis have to turn in this story to catch the Sunday morning edition? Uh, about 12.30 Saturday night. Why? Then he couldn't have been at the country club at one o'clock. And neither could his car. Oh, of course not. My car was in the parking lot back of the dispatch office from 12 o'clock on. I could have told Drake that if you'd have talked to me. Then, Jimmy, if it wasn't your car... If it wasn't, somebody made a mistake. If they made a mistake about the car, they also made a mistake about who was in it. They were all mistaken about everything because my niece was not there. Oh, Miss Greenwood, if I'd only stop to think. Mr. Drake, there are times when you have to think without stopping. Yeah, only, Miss Greenwood, it's... It's a little late to start thinking now. Connie's gone back to her folks in Monster. Well, then if I were you, Evans, I'd start out after her. Oh, no, no, that's no good. That's the way I've acted. She wouldn't even talk to me. Not if she was in her right mind. Having a chance. On the contrary, I'd say you have a pretty good chance. In cases like this, women don't think with their mind. They think with their hearts. You, you figure out. Uh, you won't even have to go to Mound City. Connie is right here. Connie! Connie, will you come out here? Connie. Oh, Connie. Oh, Tom. I've been nearly crazy, darling. Crazy at the thought that I... Yes, Tom? I might have lost you. All those things people said about you. Oh, darling. I almost gave up trying to fight that world, too. I didn't lost you, too. Gee, sometimes a guy can do some awful dumb things. It's all right, Tom. We'll just forget. Forget it ever happened. Honey, I... I don't know what to say. I, I can't talk. My lips are frozen. Oh, am I? 
they'll fall out if you put two and two together. <laughs> How does a crazy story like that ever get started? Pardon me. Who, who could have started it? Oh, it's Barbara. <laughs> While you were away at that gay and having a gay weekend at the Dude Ranch. Oh, but I, I had no idea it would lead to anything like this, Aunt Charlotte. It, it seemed like such a harmless fib. Mm-hmm. There's no such thing, darling, as a harmless fib. Even if it doesn't hurt others, it still hurts you. The punishment for fibbing isn't so much that in time nobody will believe you, but that you'll find you can't believe anybody else. Oh, I should know that, Aunt Charlotte. You've told it to us so many times and in so many ways. Sometimes we find we know too little of the things we think we know too well. Oh, what's the matter with me, Aunt Charlotte? I haven't got enough something or I'd understand words that have a familiar ring. Well, what's the matter with me? I haven't got enough something or I'd be wearing that familiar ring. Greenwood will return in just a moment. Meantime, may I remind you that letters and cards mean as much, if not more now, than when the war was on. For in spite of war's end, most of our boys are still overseas. And may I also remind you the next time you buy a card for any occasion, look on the back for the identifying words, a Hallmark card. H-A-L-L-M-A-R-K. A Hallmark card. Like sterling on silver, those three words are your assurance of finest quality. You see, it is quality that has maintained Hallmark leadership for more than 30 years. Because Hallmark quality tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. Just go to your dealer and say, I'd like to see the Hallmark card, please. Or always remember that a Hallmark card will best express your perfect taste, your thoughtfulness. And our Charlotte Greenwood. Friends, I met a friend not long ago down at the corner store. Her arms so full of packages she couldn't carry more. Said she, some things were taken off the racing list today, and so I'm buying all I see and taking it away. It's not as though I needed all these groceries for myself. It's merely that I like to see them standing on my shelf. And then I met another friend whose shopping bag was light, said she, I wonder, did you see that lovely sky last night? The stars were just like windows looking in on paradise, and I still can see them shining like a million sparkling eyes. Now I'm wondering, which is better, filling shelves with cans and jars or filling up your mental shelves with everlasting stars? And the answer is so simple that it never can be missed. God never wrote the heavens down upon a racing list. And now, until next Sunday, at the very same time, Mr. Charlotte Boone is saying, Go on, friends, on, Till next Sunday Charlotte Greenwood show came to you from Hollywood.